Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. It's a blessing to be with you all. Um, and as uh, Abuna Mark said, truly this church obviously has a deep place in my heart, and the Father's here, um, and all of East Brunswick, New Jersey, and the people that are gathered with us, many of you I've known from my childhood, so I thank God that he has brought us to this time in our lives, that we can be together and pray together um, and glorify God and raise incense together and venerate the Virgin together during this blessed fast. Um, we'll read the portion of the scriptures that um, the fathers and the servants have chosen to be the focus of St. Mary's fast this year for the church, which is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 from verses 14 to 22. I think if you were to read it every night when you have a different talk, you'd have it memorized by the end of the fast. So we'll read it together, the entire portion, and then we'll focus on the portion that we uh, will discuss tonight. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all, see that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies. Test all things, hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. So in this passage, it's actually the chapter of 1 Thessalonians uh, 5, and these verses specifically, have many, as we saw, short commandments. So in these short commandments, that's what causes some of the, the spiritual fathers, the guides, spiritual guides, to tell their spiritual children, before you go to confession, take a passage like this one, or like Romans 12, um, that we, we sit and we examine ourselves based on all of these small commandments. So by God's grace of these small commandments, um, we will focus tonight on, from verse 14, be patient with all, to be patient with all. By God's grace, we'll talk about what is patience, uh, why we should be patient, and how we can grow in our patience towards others, um, and in general, patience. So first, what is patience, when we think of patience? When you look up the dic dictionary definition, it says, patience is the capacity, the ability, to tolerate or accept, delay, trouble, or suffering, without getting angry or upset. So the ability, to accept delay, trouble, or suffering without getting angry or upset. This is the definition of patience. And so when we look at our world today and we say to tolerate delay, how many of us in a world where we have obviously cell phones, that's old news, but we have Instagram and we have um, all the Snapchat videos and we have this concept in our mind that if someone responds in five seconds, it means something. If they respond in 15 seconds, it means something. If they respond in three minutes, it means something else. And we're talking about tolerating delay. Tolerating delay. Or we have Google and we ask a question, as soon as a question pops in our mind, we can go online and we can find the answer to it. There's no need to wait for a delay. And how frustrated do we get if we're just yeah, tethering something and we're trying to find the answer and then we can't get it immediately. So we're delayed in finding our answer. Um, there's many, many different examples um, of, of us being delayed. But also it says the capacity to tolerate Delay, uh, sorry, to tolerate trouble or suffering without getting angry. Someone cuts me off on the road. Am I going to be able to tolerate trouble or suffering without getting angry? Someone, we go to a restaurant, someone makes our food a little bit um, cold, hot, different than what we asked for. Someone makes our drink wrong, we go to get coffee. Someone we love gets sick or we get sick. Are we able to, how much are we able to tolerate trouble and suffering without getting angry? without getting angry. Many of us, when we think about the command of St. Paul to not complain or dispute about anything, do all things without complaining or disputing, he says to the Philippians. And from the beginning of our day, Sayyidina Mbi Yusuf would tell us in the monastery, we start our day many times with complaining. The first thing when we wake up, what do we complain about? Waking up. Just waking up. We want to sleep more. We didn't sleep enough. And then as soon as we start our day, maybe the weather. Maybe the temperature in the house. Maybe the water didn't get hot enough quick enough. Maybe the, the toast got burned. 
and then we get into our traffic, we get into our, our normal day. So we start our day with complaints or the inability to tolerate delays, inability to tolerate sufferings. Worst of all, we see it in relationships when we treat spouses or we treat children or we treat parents with the idea that they're disposable, like they're not something that is very precious to us. We're not able to tolerate trouble or suffering but in all relationships, there will be trouble and suffering. Uh, there will be difficulties. Instead of giving the necessary time and the patience and the love and the long suffering, then we allow relationships to dwindle and to disappear because we're not patient, because we're not long suffering with one another. So some of the symptoms as we talk about patience tonight, we can think of and keep in our mind, the idea of long suffering is related to patience, of course. These are almost like synonyms. Forbearance, endurance, perseverance. Uh, these are all uh, yeah, synonyms of suffering. Also, when it comes to love, one of the things that St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, he says, love suffers long and is kind. The first thing he says about love, after he says the introductory verses, that love is more important than prayer, love is more important than faith, love is more important than works, or that those things are worthless without love, really. And yet... When he comes to start speaking about love, he says, love suffers long and is kind. So love is patient, because it suffers long. St. John Climacus, a monk from the 6th century, he says, love is an abyss of patience. Love is an abyss of patience. So it's like a great huge depth of patience. A great patience is, is to love. And even in the world, they have people like studying the effects of patience. And patience doesn't mean passivity to be passive, or to be resigned from certain things, but it's power. Emotionally, it empowers us, um, and it frees us from the, pra like the practice of us waiting and being able to wait and to be watchful and to be careful and to take our time. All this frees us emotionally from being attached and being ag from being agitated. And because we're in St. Mary's fast, we can think about how St. Mary is patient from the beginning of her life. Living a life of prayer in the temple requires patience. Prayer requires patience. Because part of what we're offering is simply patience, to stand in front of God consistently and to offer ourselves to Him patiently. Patiently waiting for the Lord. Wait in the Lord, I will be of good courage. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Uh, patience in accepting the will of God, to accept the birth of our Savior from her. That socially, this is a taboo. There's no way that her intending to live as a virgin would not be ostracized from society to a certain degree uh, because of her accepting the will of God. And for nine months, the patience of in general, just as any woman bears a child, there's patience in this. Patience in raising this child. Yes, he is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is God incarnate. But as a human being, she raised him. She taught him how to walk. She taught him how to speak, um, along with Joseph the carpenter. So there is patience in raising children. Um, the patience in traveling after her pregnancy. Immediately after her pregnancy, they're fleeing from Herod. Uh, and even before that, just to give birth to our Lord, the patience in finding a place and someone at the end of her pregnancy is very agitated, but we don't see that in St. Mary. Uh, the patience in when they're fleeing from Herod, going and to, to and from Egypt. The patience, and then at the end of her life, sorry, at the end of our Lord's life, the patience of seeing her own son, her only son, on the cross, dying. And we don't see her. We see her, to we see her tolerating delay. We see her tolerating trouble and suffering and yet, without getting angry and without getting upset. She cares for her son, she's weeping for her son before the cross, but she is patient. She trusts in the will of God. She has faith in the will of God for her son. Um, so why do we seek any virtue when we think about patience? Why are we seeking the virtue of patience or any virtues? Is, is it because society, there's many virtues in the verses that we read from First Thessalonians. Is it because society tells us these virtues are good and helpful to us? or because they're gonna help us socially or emotionally or psychologically or spiritually? Is it because they're gonna help us do something or become a certain person? Um, is it because we have people in front of us, like St. Mary, that we take them as an example, we say, I wanna be like St. Mary. The reality is all those things are good. The patience will help us in our jobs, patience will help us in traffic, patience will help us when we're waiting online, it'll help us in our relationships to be strong interpersonal people. But the number one reason why we need to struggle to be patient and to acquire any virtue is to imitate God, to imitate God, to imitate our Lord Jesus Christ, and to imitate who the Holy Trinity is. Our God is the Holy Trinity. 
we live as Christians, and when we call ourselves Christians, we are calling ourselves Christ-like. So St. Basil the Great, who I have the blessing of being named after, he says the definition of Christian is the imitation of Christ. The definition of Christian is the imitation of Christ. And St. Gregory the Theologian, who was the best friend of St. Basil in, throughout college and, and afterwards, and even in the Episcopacy, they were very good friends. St. Gregory said, as, as a patriarch, he's saying, our great pursuit, the great name we wanted was to be Christians and to be called Christians. And they're patriarchs speaking to one another. But their goal is to become a Christian, to be called a Christian rightfully so, and to live as a Christian rightfully so. St. Gregory of Nyssa, the biological brother of St. Basil, he has a beautiful homily, and it's called On What It Means to Call Oneself a Christian. And in it, he says, if one can give a definition of Christianity, we shall define it as follows. Christianity is an imitation of the divine nature. Christianity is an imitation of the divine nature to fulfill what we were called to be, to be created in the image and likeness of God. And when we fell and corruption entered into the world through our sin, we lost some of this. So we're struggling to regain, to be truly the image and likeness of God has intended to be. And if people don't see Christ in us, how will they know Christ? Our goal as servants and as Christians going about in our workplaces and our school is to present Christ to others. Because in the end, we want salvation for all people. And this is God's desire that all men uh, be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, as St. Paul says to St. Timothy. God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. What is salvation? In essence, it's a relationship. To, to mend our relationship with God, to have a deep and intimate relationship with God, personally, individually, in our homes, and in our workplaces, and we're going about, and communally, when we gather together in the church like tonight. This is our goal for every soul. For ourselves, number one, for our families, for our spouses, for our children, and for the rest of the world around us, in our local community and all around the world. Christianity is not a bunch of formulas and doctrines, uh, but these truths help us live the true Christian life. Uh, so people must meet Christ in us. If they meet Christ with us and they develop relationship with us, they see Christ in us, they see Christ in every one of us as they're going about their day, and they learn to love this relationship with the Christ that is in us. As St. Augustine said, we're all like little Christs walking around. And then we also meet Christ in other people. When we see a father or a mother taking care of their children, they learn things about God in raising their child, especially when it's their first child. The things that they learn about God, if they're focusing on their relationship with God, they would never be able to learn any other way. There's much depth in child rearing. And so we, when we serve and we live Christ-like, knowing that people around us will take our example, especially little children, then we ourselves know about God. We learn of Christ. We experience Christ's love in sharing Him with others. So while the world encourages us to be like God, so that we can replace God, our Lord and Savior is telling us, be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. Be holy as your Heavenly Father is holy. And we are called to be like God in Christianity, but so that we can present God's love to the world. And so if we're saying we're, we're calling the call, our calling is to become patient. It's because God is patient. We're imitating God's patience in His long suffering. So we read in the book of Numbers, and as we read from the scriptures, there in front. So in the book of Numbers, it says, The Lord is long suffering and abundant in mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression. The Lord is long suffering. He is he's tolerating <coughs> suffering, He's tolerating trouble, He is tolerating delay. And then King David prays in the Psalms. He's praying out to God. He says in Psalm 86, verse 15, You, O Lord, are a God full of compassion, and gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in mercy and truth. So God, God is long-suffering with us. And St. Augustine reminds us, he has a homily on patience as well, and he reminds us and said, just because we're saying that God is long-suffering, let us not be uh, deceived to think that God has a certain amount of energy and a certain amount of patience that it will eventually run out. When we say that God is long-suffering and God is patient, it's not because God changes. God is immutable. But in our human terms, we call God long-suffering. 
because he is patient with us. He is long-suffering with us. That's how we perceive it. But in reality, God is simply good. As we say in our liturgical prayers, before we ask him for anything, we ask and entreat of your goodness. He is the good one and lover of mankind. So therefore, he is perfectly patient. He is perfectly long-suffering. So when we ask ourselves, why should I be patient? First and foremost is God is patient. And we are called to be imitators of Christ, imitators of the Holy Trinity, um, to fulfill us being created in the image and likeness of God. And there's two main reasons why God is long-suffering and patient with us. Number one, it's to give us an opportunity to repent, an opportunity to change ourselves. Um, and so we are called to give opportunity for others to change themselves, to repent. So we read in uh, 2 Peter, he says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So the reason that he is long-suffering and patient is that not, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And a couple of verses later he says, consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. The long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. There's several ways we can do a Bible study. And one of them is to look for the terms that we're studying. So we're studying patience. We're going through many different verses in the Bible to bring about not just one verse and focus on it. But we said today's focus verse is to be patient with all. So we're trying to look for long-suffering and patience through the Scriptures. St. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 2, Do you despise the richness, riches of His goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? The goodness of God is seen in His forbearance and His long-suffering. And so this is supposed to lead us to repentance. The fact that we know we have a loving and caring God, a merciful and long-suffering God. So I shouldn't take this for granted. When I see someone that is long-suffering and patient with me, I shouldn't say, oh, they're patient, they're gonna, they're gonna continue to be the way that they are. Um, and I should just take advantage of them. St. Cyril of Jerusalem, um, the Patriarch of Jerusalem in the fourth century, he warns us of this. And he says, great is God's forbearance. Great is God's forbearance. Lavish in His grace, enjoy His grace. But do not let His great patience breed contempt. Let us not be contemptuous against God's great patience. Do not make God's long-suffering a pretext for continuing in sin. For sin. So St. Cyril is warning us, do not make God's long-suffering a pretext for continuing in sin. Because God is not going to yeah, he take away the opportunity to repent right now. So I'm going to continue in sin and deceive him and, and uh, betray him throughout my life? Of course not. No friend would accept this from another person. So much more so from God. We shouldn't allow God's long-suffering to be a pretext for us to continue in sin. And when I realize God's mercy and His patience with me, and that He struggles and waits for me, uh, and gives me opportunity to reroute and to repent, so then I will be able to be merciful and patient and loving towards others. So St. Paul realized this, and he says uh, to his disciple Timothy, For this reason I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering. That when people see St. Paul and how he persecuted the church, we see the long-suffering of God it, that, that was in St. Paul's life. That although he persecuted him to the point where our Lord Jesus Christ appears and says, Why are you persecuting me? And yet, God's long-suffering was shown in St. Paul. And that he allowed him to repent and become the great apostle St. Paul. So he says, In me first Jesus Christ might show our long-suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. So when people see me long-suffering and patient with others and with them, they will see Christ in me. And they will trust that God also is being patient with them. That God is a genuine and merciful and loving and good God. In the Shepherd of Hermes, one of the early apostolic writings, um, the Shepherd of Hermes, he says, The Lord lives in patience. The devil lives in an angry temper. The Lord lives in patience. The devil lives in an angry temper. So the Lord is present. The Lord makes Himself known. The Lord manifests Himself. He is realized in patience. The Lord lives in patience. He is present when we are patient. And there's a story of Abba Isidore. As Abuna mentioned, I have the blessing of being from the monastery of St. Moses, which I know many of you have seen or have heard of. And who was the elder of St. Moses? There was St. Macarius, who was his father of confession, sorry, of his spiritual elder, his spiritual guide. 
and St. Isidore was his father of confession. St. Isidore was known as the priest of el Kilia or the cells. A whole entire region of 3,000 monks was taken care of by St. Isidore. And we know the life of St. Moses is strong, living very far from God and sinful. This saying is said of Abba Isidore, his elder, the one that accepted him into the monastery. And we would expect this of such a person. It says, they used to say of Abba Isidore, the priest of Skeet or Shahid, that if anybody had a brother who was weak, negligent or insolent, lazy, and he wanted to throw him out, throw him out of the monastery, the elder would say, bring him to me. He would take the brother into his cell and save him through long suffering and patience. Or sorry, through long suffering patience. The patience, yani, we, we are called to be patient with others as Christian servants. And I always equate Christianity with service. If you are called a Christian, then you are called a servant. I remember when I was starting to come uh, more regularly to the church here, there was hymns classes on, I don't know if they're still on Monday night, but I would come on Monday night. I wanted to attend one of the hymns classes. And there were like four or fifth graders and I was in college. And I genuinely just wanted to learn the hymn that they were learning. I didn't know what the hymn was. I just couldn't say it. So I was there to learn the hymn. And I wasn't a servant officially by any means in, in the church or, or in any other place for that matter. I, maybe I began to serve in college, but nobody knew me as a servant in church. I was going to learn the hymn. As soon as I walked in, the two servants, uh, Yanni wanted to introduce me because I'm, I'm an adult. Yanni coming to the class, or I'm at least in college, and they're all fourth and fifth graders. So as soon as I asked, so as soon as they asked the kids, do you know who this is? They just, raised, he's a servant. Servant me, not a servant. I came to learn the lesson. Why do they think I'm a servant? My height, simply my height. And it, I'm tall, and I look like I'm older, and I look like the servants that are serving them, so I must be a servant. The reality is if we're calling ourselves Christians, we are servants. We have to have the service. And yani, service number one in our house, service number two in our workplaces, in our schools, and a service in the church, in our community, our local community. So St. Paul reminds us of this. And he says to the Corinthians, in all things we commend ourselves as ministers of God, as servants of God, in much patience. The first thing he says, in much patience. A servant must have much patience. There was something that was posted online uh, some time ago and I read it and it was, it was beneficial for me. It said that a, a young lady was driving uh, to go to church, sorry, not to go to church, to go to, to school. Um, and in front of her was a Jeep and in the back of it was taped a piece of paper that said, learning stick, sorry for the delay. So it just said paper on the back of the car so that the person behind that car could read it. Learning stick, sorry for the delay. And the person wrote the post about this and she meditated on this thinking to herself, this person wasn't really delaying. They were doing pretty well. If it's the first time that the learning stick, they're still learning. And yeah, they're going a little bit slow, but they're doing really well. And then she began to think to herself, if I didn't know that this person had this sign there, would I be getting agitated? Would I be getting angry? Would I be getting impatient because I'm being delayed? And so she thought and she benefited from this and said to herself, how many people are experiencing trouble and difficulties in their lives? All of us, in one way or another, as long as we are in this life, in the world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. There will be tribulation. But we don't know all of each other's internal struggles or even our external struggles or even our relationships with one another and how difficult sometimes things can be. But we don't, do we, do we you know, make it a point to give each other the benefit of the doubt? So she said in this post, you don't see signs taped on people's shirts that say going through a divorce, lost a child, feeling depressed, diagnosed with cancer. You don't see people with shirts saying these things. Just like this person had a sign saying learning stick, sorry for the delay. And so we are called, as she says at the end of the post, whether they deserve it or not, let us give everyone an extra dose of patience, kindness, and love. To treat others with kindness, and especially strangers, we don't know their circumstances, uh, with kindness and with love. Because our patience, just like this young lady, gives the opportunity for others to learn in peace, encourages them to be able to learn, encourages them without fear, and rather with hope, to be able to continue to learn and to grow in their life with God. And that brings us to our second reason why. So we said the first reason, of why we struggle in the virtue to acquire the virtue of patience is number one, to imitate God. But within that is the two reasons. So to imitate God, because God, what He desires for us to repent. He, 
his patience allows us opportunity to repent. And the second is that it leads us to progress in our life with him, in our relationship with him, unto salvation. So first is to go from negative to zero, that's like repentance, like to go from negative to zero, and then secondly to go from zero to 100, and to grow in our relationship with God, to repent from our sins, patience gives us the opportunity to do that, and others to do that, and then it brings us to deepen or progress in our relationship with God, to grow in our relationship with God, unto salvation. And that's why we see our Lord Jesus Christ saying, by your patience, possess your souls. By your patience, possess your souls. When we struggle in the virtue of patience, we will possess our souls. An elder in the monastery said, we are not progressing because we do not understand our own stature and do not have patience in the work we initiate, but desire to acquire virtue effortlessly. So we desire to, to acquire virtue effortlessly, without effort. And some people think like by osmosis, I'm gonna spend time with a holy person or with a righteous person, and all of a sudden I'm gonna become that person. Definitely we wanna spend time, and we'll talk about that. We wanna spend time with others to learn from them. But just by spending time with them all the time doesn't mean I'm gonna learn by osmosis how to become person that is righteous and living a life with God, a life pleasing to God. So St. James tells us in his epistle, in chapter 5, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Imagine that we go and we plant seeds today, and then tomorrow we're going to the, to the land and expecting that we will produce fruits. And if we go and plant seeds today, and we're going to go out with baskets and things to go collect our fruits that we planted yesterday. And if we're planting seeds today, we're expecting fruit. Of course, that's nonsense. We don't expect it. It's ignorance. It's unreasonable. But when we are patient in bearing fruit, in, in progressing in our life with God, we're looking forward to the precious fruit of a righteous life with God. This is our precious fruit. Just like the farmer is patient so, it can so that the ground that he planted can produce fruit, the seed can bear fruit. So we also are patient because our precious fruit is a righteous life with God. Bearing the fruit, as we'll speak about, of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, faithfulness. All these things are the fruit of a righteous life with God. The fruit of a life um, of patience. In the parable of the sower, we see our Lord saying about the, the good soil. He says, the ones that fell on the good ground are those who having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. So it's good ground, but I still need patience. I still need patience. And the farmer has to endure many things. This plant has to, he has to make sure that this plant is going to endure. Very cold weather, very windy weather, very hot weather, no moisture. Um, very sunny, very dry, if there's mold, if there's insects. And we too, in our spiritual life, we have spiritual equivalents. So there will be some dryness. It's not going to be that we're, we're very fervent every time that we pray. There will be dryness in our prayer, in our reading of the scriptures. And we endure patiently, knowing that we are waiting for the precious fruit of a life with God, of a deep, intimate life with God. Um, the false praise of others, the neglect of some, these are all like the winds and, and the sun that's beaming on this plant that's struggling to grow. We have to be patient when someone neglects us or scorns us. We have to be patient when someone is praising us and yet we know we don't deserve the praise or they're praising us falsely. Um, listening and caring for the needs of others patiently. When we see, I was just uh, out with a youth and he was telling me he's a medical student doing a fellowship uh, after he finished medical school. And he's telling me how he went out with um, the person that's leading the fellowship, uh, along with some other doctors. And they went to a restaurant to eat, and the, the boss doctor, like the, the leader of the fellowship, he, was, uh, he offered to get everyone a drink, an alcoholic drink. And this young man is a faithful Orthodox Christian. He's saying, no, I'll just have some water. And he got a look from everyone at the table, like 10, 12 people that are with him. And he was told afterwards, you can't do that. Like, you can't, you can't expect that this person that's leading your fellowship is going to offer you something and you just say no. Um, 
And so it's very difficult. We have to be patient in the midst of such circumstances. Um, we have to know that the ridiculing and the mocking of society against the pure Christian way is going to be something that we're going to have to endure and be long-suffering with. Uh, but we're looking forward towards the precious fruit of a righteous life with God. An encouraging verse in this is Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. St. Paul tells us, Let us not grow weary, let us not slack, let us not grow faint, let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season, in the time that God sees fit, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. We shall reap if we do not lose heart. And this is what we mentioned, the fruit of the Spirit is what we will reap. We will reap love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness and faithfulness and self-control. This is what we will reap in due time if we do not lose heart, if we're struggling to remain patient. St. Paul tells us we do not wrestle because the people that are giving us a difficult time or the society that is putting pressure on us, maybe they're not intending to do so, but this is what they've learned, what they've grown up with. So we have to recognize our war is not with them, with people. But as St. Paul says in Ephesians, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And there is uh, an early Christian philosopher named Lactantius, Lactet, sorry, Lactantius, and he was saying that even when we defend the faith against people that are rebuking us and not accepting the pure Christian faith, he says religion ought to be defended not by killing, but by dying, not by fury, but by patience. Not by crime, but by faith. And he says, Indeed, to defend religion by blood, if by torments, if by evil, then it will not be defended. It will be polluted and violated. So we have to defend our faith with patience, speaking the truth in love. So we spoke about why we should be patient, and we said to imitate God. And underneath that, why God is being patient and long-suffering with us, to give us an opportunity to repent, to go from negative to zero, to repent of our sins, and also to grow and to progress in our relationship with God unto salvation, that by our patience we may possess our souls. So now we come to the question of how to be patient. And we'll briefly speak about five ways to be patient. The first, by, fir by first and foremost, is to pray. Any virtue, just like we said, any virtue is to imitate Christ. That is why we pursue any virtue. Any virtue is acquired, number one, by prayer. By uniting with God, by deepening our relationship with God. And it's like a circle. When I deepen my relationship with God, I will grow in virtue. When I grow in virtue, I will grow in my relationship with God. And all the virtues are related to one another. Because we said patience and long-suffering is a fruit of the Spirit. So if it is a fruit of the Spirit, then we ask of God that He fill us with His Holy Spirit that we may bear this fruit. And it seems like a simple thing that we always talk about prayer as the foundation for everything. But genuinely, and for those who have struggled with this, you have experienced it, I'm sure, that when we genuinely come every morning and ask God to guard us from a certain sin throughout the day, to have us grow in a certain virtue, little by little, we will see Him pouring of His Spirit into our hearts and giving us grace to overcome these wars. Or maybe He will take them away, we will not be aware of these wars during the day. But God does protect us. But we have to come to Him asking. In Colossians, St. Paul says, Strengthened with all might, according to His glorious power, for all patience and long-suffering with joy. So I'm strengthened by the might of God. I stand before Him and I acquire from Him His likeness. I ask Him to grant me long-suffering and patience. And by, my, by Him strengthening me, According to his glorious power, the reason that he strengthens me is for patience and long-suffering with joy. With joy. Because we said that patience is to tolerate delay or tolerate trouble or suffering without getting angry, without getting upset. So here I'm tolerating with joy. Uh, and in the scriptures, uh, St. Paul says to the Romans, whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. So when we learn the scriptures, and we learn the stories of the faithfulness, of being patient, and uh, God comforting others, we will have hope through the scriptures. 
and the God of patience and comfort. Our God is called the God of patience and comfort to the Romans. May he grant you to be like-minded uh, toward one another. This is St. Paul's prayer for the Romans. St. John Climacus says, ask with tears, seek, when he says ask, seek and knock, ask with tears, seek with obedience, and knock with patience. Ask with tears, seek with obedience, knock with patience. So the first thing we have to keep in mind of how to acquire, to become more patient, or to become less impatient, is to pray, to ask of God. Anything else that we do will be worthless if we do not combine it with prayer, to seek it from God. Second is to recognize difficulties are good for us. Difficulties, the things that we're asked to be patient in, are helpful to us. So we see St. James reminding us of this. He says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. A tree, when it is at, when we're, we're planting a tree, when the strong winds blow, it will make the tree to go deep in its roots. It will make the tree to grow deep in its roots. Yes, it needs soil. Yes, it needs uh, sun, and it needs nutrients, it needs fertilizer, it needs water. But it also needs some resistance so that it can grow deep in its roots. There's a story in the monastic father's uh, writings of a monk, and he was very impatient with the brethren. And he wanted to go and to learn patience. So he kept on begging his elder, I cannot live with the community anymore. I need to grow, I'm not able to grow in the community anymore. And he was struggling with judgment, he was struggling with patience, impatience, and he was struggling with anger. So he kept on begging his elder, let me go live in solitude by myself so I can grow in this virtue. And the elder did not bless this path for him. But he went anyways, and he lived by himself. And then as he was going to fill his water jug, he filled his water jug, or he was taking water out of it, and then he put it back, and it fell over. And then he picked it up, patiently, picked it up and put it back. And he's by himself, he's nobody's with him. And then it fell over again, and he got a little upset. And then it fell over again because of the wind, the wind was just blowing, it fell over again. And he got upset and he smashed the jug. And he realized that even if no one is around him, he can still be very impatient. It's not about the people and the circumstances that we're in. It's an internal battle. And so we recognize the difficulties that come to us that because God knows that we may not humble ourselves on our own, so he gives us opportunities to learn humility, to learn patience, to learn love, to learn joy in the midst of tribulation. Because we on ourselves may not pursue such virtues, pursue such a life of God. And that's why St. Moses, the strong, he says this, this disciple was, was disobedient. That's why he went into the wilderness to live by himself, thinking that he was going to grow in patience. St. Moses, the strong, says, let us acquire obedience, which begets humility and brings endurance, long-suffering, grief for sin, brotherly love and charity, for these are our weapons of war. So when we're obedient and we're, we're struggling to learn humility, we also will learn endurance and long suffering. Um, so we said first to learn obedience, sorry, to learn humility. We struggle to pray daily and consistently to ask of God of His virtue. Secondly, we realize that the difficulties that happen to us, they will bring virtues to us. We will grow through these difficulties, just like the tree grows by some resistance. Third is to have examples in front of us have examples in front of us. We mentioned the example of St. Mary earlier, and St. Paul tells us, do not become sluggish, do not become lazy, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Patience is a struggle against anger, and it's also a struggle against laziness. To grow in patience is to struggle against laziness. So that's why a little later in the same chapter, he's speaking of Abraham, the arch prophet, and he says, when God made a promise to Abraham, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. So he says, when God made a promise to Abraham, when you go to verse 14, 15, it says, he obtained the promise. After he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Abraham left his home, his family, everything that he knew, patiently. He took the promise from God. He was going to be the father of many nations. And he's patient. He doesn't have a son yet. In his old age, God gives him a son. 
after all this patience. And then he asks to take his son that he gave him, his beloved son Isaac. And Abraham is patient in this. So in his obedience, he learns patience as well. St. James says, my brethren, take the prophets. We're talking about taking examples. So he says, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed to endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Job's suffering and his long suffering showed us the compassion and the mercy of God, that God gave him double portion after he was patient and long suffering. And of course, as we said in the beginning, we imitate our Lord Jesus Christ. The suffering that our Lord endured, uh, St. Gregory the Great in his book, Pastoral, uh, The Pastoral Rule, um, he speaks about the, the patience and the long suffering that the shepherd must have, the servant must have, the pastor must have, to imitate our Lord Jesus Christ. That how many horrible insults and reproaches he endured, how many blows in the face he received, at the hands of scoffers, while he was daily uh, snatching the souls of captives from the power of the enemy. And our Lord is in enduring all this suffering for our sakes, as we say in the St. Gregory liturgy. He accepted all this for our sakes. And if the people around us are impatient, then we will grow in our impatience if we keep the people around us impatient. They say that if you take your four good friends that you spend the most time with, or four people in general, any relationship that you have, Look at anything that they have in their life and you will find yourself in the center. So if they like a certain hobby, if they're patient, if they're loving, if they're willing to give to others without seeking something in return, if they're faithful in their work, if they're faithful in rearing their children, if they're faithful in their coming to church and serving in the church, whatever it is, it is that they value, if we look at the people we spend the most time with, we'll find ourselves somewhere in the middle of them. This is sociology. Fourthly, we struggle and we recognize that our responsibility is to struggle to acquire patience, not to be victorious in it. Our goal in spiritual life is not to be victorious. It's simply to struggle, to continue to struggle. They say us and God are in a rowboat, and we have to choose. Are we going to sit there and guide the rowboat and say, God, I want to go this way, I want to go, I, I want to, go to this place, and, and keep struggling? Or are we going to be the ones paddling and struggling and allowing God to guide our lives? We have a choice. We have to do one or the other. So St. James says, be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. A doctor was uh, facing his patient one day, and he, the patient thought that he was going to spend a long time in the hospital. So he said, how long do I have to be here in the hospital? And he says, today, one day at a time. One day at a time is how long you have to be in the hospital. There's no reason to think about I'm not going to acquire the great virtue of patience and be able to be like so-and-so. I take the examples, I keep them in front of me to encourage me, but I know that God is looking at my struggle. Um, a Roman Catholic saint said something very valuable. He said, have patience with all things, but first of all, with yourself. Have patience with all things, but first of all, with yourself. Don't expect that all of a sudden we're going to grow in a virtue. To not fall into the temptation that the devil tempts us with many times, of despair or of self-pity. If we're not falling into pride, he's gonna try and push us to despair. Um, in Hebrews chapter six, we recognize patience is not an all or nothing battle. St. Paul says, God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love which you have shown toward his name. God knows all the labor of love that we offer, struggling to imitate him, struggling to be faithful to our Christian walk. And there's a story in the Taras, the fathers of a disciple, that was used to coming to his elder every night. And when he would come to his elder, he would be dismissed and blessed by the elder. So he would go and sit by his side after the elder would give him a spiritual word. The elder would bless him and dismiss him. But the elder fell asleep one day. And the disciple was sitting by his side, waiting to be blessed by his elder. And the disciple is getting very tired now. And he's struggling against sleep. He keeps on struggling throughout the night. And then the elder wakes up after several hours. And he says, what are you doing here, my son? And he says, you have not blessed me to depart. So he blesses him and he allows him to depart. And then the next day, the elder comes and asks his disciple, he said, what did you do last night? I saw a vision of you receiving seven crowns. 
And I, I know that this is something that you did last night because it was something that happened while I was sleeping last night. And he said, nothing, Father. I just sat there with you and I waited for you. And he said, no, you must have done something. He said, all I did was I struggled to resist, to be impatient, to leave without getting your blessing. I was used to getting your blessing every day. And seven times he struggled. He was going to leave and get up. And yet he did not get up, but he rather was obedient to the rule that he had with his spiritual elder, that he would take his blessing first. And so the elder saw that he was receiving seven crowns just for struggling with the thought to not leave. God is looking at us. Many times we focus on the fact that God knows all of our thoughts and we say that our thoughts are evil, our thoughts are sinful. Yes, a thought can be a sin if we accept it and start thinking about it. That's the, the, the seed of sin. And we continue, if we grow, it will come into action, it will turn into words. Um, but also God looks at every single one of our thoughts of struggle to not get distracted when we come to liturgical prayers, to hold our tongue when we want to say something that is not beneficial or to hold our tongue when we want to say something that would anger somebody else. God is looking at this struggle uh, for us to acquire patience. So we are called to recognize that God knows this struggle that's happening internally and He wants to reward us for it. And to the Bishop of Ephesus in the book of Revelations, He says, I know your works, your labor, your patience. I know your works, your labor, and your patience. It's very clear that God, He understands and He knows the struggle. St. Augustine says to us, all patient endurance is melody to God's ears. All patient endurance is melody to God's ears. So even if I'm struggling to be patient, I lose my patience, God sees that. This is a stepping stone for me to grow in patience. That next time, maybe I won't. Maybe, maybe I'll wait a little bit longer before I become impatient. And next time, it'll take two or three situations before I lose my patience. But if I put the virtue in front of me, then I will be able to acquire it. He says, all patient endurance is melody to God's ears. But if you give way under tribulations like that, you have broken your lyre, broken the instrument by which you are making melody to God's ears, if you give way to tribulation. The fifth and last way that we can learn patience is through nature, through nature. There was um, a contemporary writer that wrote, he said, adopt the pace of nature, her secret is patience. Adopt the pace of nature, her secret is patience. When we observe nature and the things that are in nature, we see that nature itself is slow and calm and patient and long-suffering. So we see that the sun is coming up slowly. The sun is setting slowly. The movement of the clouds is slow. The growing of the trees and the plants, as we mentioned, is slow. All these things are, are, are supposed to be teaching us. The early Christians and people 200, 300 years ago, they spent much time meditating on the world, meditating on nature, spending time and giving ample time to sit in silence and to be able to observe or to just be walking from one place to another. They have time to observe. They don't have, they're not constantly on their phones. And of course we know that one of the struggles that's obvious that I'm not mentioning today is with So I'm sure you've heard this many times, but to make time in our day where we say, I'm, not, I'm only gonna have a limited amount of time with this device. This is the only time that I have for this device or for this particular task or this app. This will have us grow in patience because we become impatient because we have everything instant. Um, and we, we see our Lord Jesus Christ when he served and did all that he did in three and a half years, a very successful service. What pace was he serving? They say he's serving at three miles per hour. This is the speed, the common speed of walking, three miles per hour. This is the pace that he served at and the pace that he loved at and the pace that he offered himself at. And so we can acquire the virtue of patience by taking time aside to observe nature, to observe the natural way of life. And it will help us realize that it's not a waste of time to sit there and observe and to give time and to listen and to be patient with others. So we spoke in summary about the virtue of patience tonight. Be patient with all, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14. And we said the number one for us to be patient is to imitate God, so that we can be like God and that He allows us time to be, um, to be able to repent. He gives us the opportunity to repent and to return to Him by His patience, by His long suffering. And if we don't recognize that, we will not be able to be patient with others. That must be the foundation, that we recognize God's loving kindness and His long suffering for us. And then also, 
he's long suffering with us that he can bring us to progress in our life with God that we may bear the fruits of the spirit and that we may be patient unto salvation by your patience possess your souls we spoke about five ways to acquire the virtue of patience first we said we have to pray for it consistently as St. John Climacus says uh, said ask Ask with tears, seek with obedience, not with patience. Ask with tears, seek with obedience, not with patience. And we heard the shepherd of Hermes telling us that God, the Lord lives in patience. The Lord lives in patience. To recognize the difficulties are good for us. They help us to grow. As we said, trees need resistance so they can search for deeper waters and for nutrients. And thirdly, we said to see the examples of others around us. We saw the example of Abraham, and of Job, and of St. Mary, and first and foremost of our Lord Jesus Christ in his suffering for our salvation. Fourthly, to struggle is our goal. Our goal is to struggle, not to acquire all of patience all of a sudden. St. Moses the Strong struggled for 17 years before he was overcoming some of his sins. 17 years. I mean, it's not something that all of a sudden he's going to become the great St. Moses. He's the strong St. Moses because his repentance was strong and patient. And we heard from the Catholic saint that said to us, have patience in all things, first and foremost with ourselves. And lastly, to spend time in nature, to spend time in solitude, observing the natural way of life, that we may learn how we as human beings were intended to live in patience, calmly, and not thinking that, oh, I didn't get enough done today. Of course, we have to put goals for ourselves, but to learn to acquire patience. Lastly, I want to end with a story that uh, is very encouraging to many. And it was a priest that was in a church one day, and a young lady walked into the church, and he asked her a simple question. He said, are you here to pray? It was this woman that he had not seen before at the church. And he asked her with a joyful face, are you here to pray? Because usually people come to the church to pray. And she said to him, no. And then she, uh, she was asked by him, are you here because you want to pray? And there was no one else in the church except for her. And she thought about it for a little, and she said, no. And then he said, are you here because you want to want to pray? Are you here because you desire to desire to pray? And she said to him, yes, that is why I'm here. I'm here because I want to want to pray. I'm here because I, I want, I'm standing before you because I want to desire patience. Because I want to desire to be long-suffering. I want to desire to live a life with you. I don't desire this right now. God is patient to this degree that he is long-suffering with us, and he accepts this as the beginning, a seed of our prayer life. Something that we're offering to God that he can work with. That we're not sorry, that we're not sorry for our sins. We commit sins that we're not sorry, that we're not sorry for. Or we, we stand before God, and we don't desire to stand before God. We're going to say the veneration for St. Mary right now. And all of this is praise to God. We're venerating St. Mary because she is the mother of God. We stand before him, let us offer whatever we have in our hearts of this day to him. Our prayer is acceptable before God as long as it is genuine. If we try to make like a, a, a mask in front of God, God knows our hearts. But he asks us to pray to him and stand before him and, and he asks us, where are you, Adam? He knows where he is. There's no one in the world except for Adam and God. And yet he still says, where are you, Adam? He wants us to confess to him the genuineness of our heart. May God grant us to live a genuine life with God. And grant us, first and foremost, the virtue of patience that we spoke about tonight, that we may imitate our God in his long-suffering and his love. So glory be to him.